down on the sticker placed on the table. Uh, today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format. We have several um, people online here. For members in the room, please raise your hand if you wish to speak. For members on Zoom, use your raise hand function and the comments go through the chair. Any technical issues arise, please let us know and we will suspend immediately in order to ensure translation is there. Pursuant to Standing Order 1082 and the motion adopted by the committee on Tuesday, October 17, 2023, the committee is resuming its study of the 2026 CUSMA review. And with us today, we have Anna Zalek, Professor Environmental and Urban Change, York University by video conference, and Meredith Lilly, Simon Reisman Chair in International Economic Policy, Carleton University, from the Canadian Cattle Association, Dennis Laycraft, Executive Vice President, Jack Schaff, Officer at Large, Council of Canadians, Nicholas Barry Shaw, Trade and Privatization Campaigner by video conference, from the Fisheries Council of Canada, Paul Landsbergen, President, and from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Sean Heather, Senior Vice President, International Regulatory, Regulatory Affairs and Antitrust. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. Apologies for the late start, but uh, I think you've, been, you've all been here enough to know how it all works. Uh, so we'll start with opening remarks with Dr. Zellick, please, for up to five minutes. Thank you very much to the chair and the committee for the invitation to present insights here and to Clerk Sophia Nickel for her assistance in making this possible. Um, over the past 20 years, my research has concerned the geopolitics of the oil industry, and I've conducted extensive field work in oil producing regions in Mexico, among other regions, and Nigeria, and I have also researched oil and gas regulation in Canada. Um, as well as the role of Canadian extractive firms at the UN agency responsible for managing deep sea mining in the seabed outside state jurisdiction, the International Seabed Authority. Recently, a significant portion of my work has concerned Canadian investment in the restructured Mexican energy sector brought about by Mexico's, Mexico's controversial 2013 energy reform. At present, I speak to you from Mexico City, where we just completed the Mexican leg of a binational intensive field course on the CUSMA. Um, and the second and final week of this course will continue at York University in the last week in June. I would note that Canada's renewed and sudden visa restrictions on Mexico at the end of February created a significant and unexpected logistical problem for us in planning the course, and I would underline that policy change as an irritant in ongoing relations between the two countries. So since the implementation of the Mexican energy reform and over the past decade, the continental energy relationship has transformed particularly as United States, which had previously been a net importer of fossil fuels, including from Canada and Mexico, became a net global exporter. And this in particular of natural gas from its fracking boom to the Mexican energy grid. Although this predated COVID, this exhibits so-called nearshoring, which in the pandemic's aftermath is often invoked as a means to prevent supply chain blockages through physical and often terrestrial proximity. But the result here has involved a reversal in Mexican energy sovereignty in a form similar to the reversal in Mexican food sovereignty that resulted from the NAFTA Accord, after which Mexico shifted from being a net exporter to a net importer of corn. So the same has occurred now with relationship to Mexico's hydrocarbon supply. Now, the gas um, that is delivered to Mexico comes via a pipeline system in which Export Development Canada has been a significant um, investor, and this particularly given the role of TC Energy, formerly TransCanada Pipelines, as a major Canadian investor in Mexico. Indeed, in recent years, TC Energy has touted itself as the single largest Canadian investor in Mexico. TC Energy's major role in the distribution of gas across the continent um, has come at a considerable cost to not only Mexican energy sovereignty, but to broader civil society's role across North America in meaningful climate policy. And this is seen, for instance, in TC Energy's controversial ISDS case against the U.S. government for the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline expansion. 
that climate change and indigenous rights receive limited um, substantive treatment in Kuzma is a significant area for consideration in the review, as is the need to take advantage of the best aspects of Kuzma to develop a continental climate plan for a collectively managed transition off of fossil fuels. The lack of language or an annex on climate agreements makes all three states in the agreement vulnerable to claims if they seek to alter their domestic policies to reduce overall carbon emissions. For Mexico, this is particularly acute given annexes and articles that prevent Mexico from reforming particular elements in its electricity sector, and these tensions are seen in the tabling of complaints by both Canada and the U.S. in the last couple of years with relation to the role of bodies such as Mexico's Federal Electricity Commission and Pemex. So a proper plan for continental energy transition would require independent, ongoing modeling and research that would entail an analysis of the life cycle emissions and hazards posted by various energy sources, including from the process of extracting and continentally transporting fracked gas. And this would require substantively and enforceably raising rather than lowering the bar that made accidents such as that in Lac Megantic, Quebec possible. This would also require the end of the threat of ISDS to, on Mexico should it wish to modify contracts or promote its own energy sources. Because at the present, are, Mexico is at risk of these being interpreted as negatively impacting private Canadian and US firms. And a pros proposal to this effect I noted is included in the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives recent publication on the Kuzma Review, which calls for a moratorium on trade and investment rules that would challenge um, climate change policies. It also calls for a rapid response environmental enforcement tool similar to the successful rapid response labor mechanism, which we discussed in significant detail in this course in Mexico City over the past week. So I would note here that Kuzma can be updated to strengthen continental leadership, not only in labor um, rights, as the Kuzma Agreement does and stands out internationally, but also in environmental and social policy, thus in Indigenous rights, climate commitments, and notably on the protection of migrants. In US, Canada, Mexico, creating a level playing field in labor protections by raising them, and in the enforcement of global norms around upholding Indigenous rights and substantive emissions reductions, as well as investigating gender-based violence in the context of domestic work, would be essential elements in confronting key contemporary global challenges. So I guess I would just end by noting that an ex expanding the existing rapid response mechanism for labor violations to agriculture and migrant labor, as well as adopting a similar kind of mechanism for both disputes around environmental conditions so that they would be handled in an effective and efficient form, and disputes over indigenous rights and human rights more broadly, um, would create the basis for all three parties complying potentially with their requirements under the IPCC and the Paris Agreement. Um, I thank you very much for your time and consideration. I'm happy to discuss these contents, the comments thank, further. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dr. Zalek. Dr. Lilly, please. Thank you, Chair Scro and committee members for the invitation to be here today. I teach North American trade relations, and this is also my primary area of research. I participate in a number of trilateral initiatives focused on North American trade, including those led by U.S. and Mexican partners. I write extensively on the implementation of Kuzma, and I'm completing a report now on the upcoming review that I'd be pleased to share with the committee. So I'm really pleased that the committee has established this study, and I hope it marks the beginning of sustained parliamentary focus on this important file. Canada's objective for the 2026 review should be the extension of Kuzma by all three countries. Realistically, this is going to be challenging, but it should be our goal nonetheless. In order to be successful, it is incumbent on Canada to prepare extensively over the next year. I want to underscore the urgency because July 1, 2026 represents the cleanest opportunity to reach trilateral agreement to extend the agreement for 16 more years. If that doesn't occur, then a joint review takes place and these reviews continue annually until all three countries agree to extend the agreement or it eventually terminates in 2036. 
Clearly, the latter scenario of annual reviews would be destabilizing for business and would undermine trade and investment certainty in North America. So today I'd like to focus my comments on three processes Canada should put in place now to secure the best possible outcome for our country in 2026. First, the proactive engagement by this committee to launch this Kuzma study must be paralleled at the officials level. We need a named senior official at Global Affairs to lead Canada's activities and this work should be their exclusive daily focus. Their team should launch broad consultations with Canadian stakeholders on the implementation of Kuzma and they should work to develop solutions to the irritants they encounter before 2026. They should also work to develop proposals to address new shared trilateral challenges such as artificial intelligence, digital privacy and the disruptive consequences for electric vehicle supply chains and national security. Canada can lead the development of proposals for adoption by Kuzma Partners, which focus on North American-made parts and production to reflect industry changes while satisfying the interests of all three countries. Canada can't wait for pressure from the U.S. to launch our own domestic Kuzma review process. Americans will be preoccupied this year with the U.S. presidential election. However, when the U.S. Congress does turn its attention to its own U.S. domestic review in 2025, it will be understandably focused on advancing U.S. interests. The best way for Canada to steer the six-year review toward our desired outcomes then is to have developed our solutions by spring of 2025. Committee members should know that Mexico has already announced the launch of its own domestic consultations. Secondly, if the extension of Kuzma in 2026 is Canada's goal, then we have to demonstrate that it's working well now, which for the most part it is. In addition, we must demonstrate that dispute settlement processes can be effective. This means encouraging all three countries to abide by rulings under the Kuzma process, even when our interests are not satisfied, such as on aspects of Canada's tariff rate quote allocation process for dairy. But implementing Kuzma in good faith also means not adopting legislation and regulatory measures that contravene Kuzma and antagonize the Americans. For example, on digital trade, the online Dreaming Act would be in violation of the digital chapter of Kuzma if it were not for Canada's cultural exemption. Similarly, unilateral action by Canada to introduce a digital services tax will discriminate against large U.S. firms. We should be prepared for U.S. retaliation if these measures are enacted, and Canadian lawmakers should be aware of the damaging consequences for the broader Kuzma review process. Third, as committee members know, China will be the elephant in the room leading up to and throughout the Kuzma review. In particular, new tariffs on Chinese EVs, steel and aluminum pronounced by President Biden will necessarily impact the integrated North American supply chain. This U.S. trade action will increase the likelihood of a surge in transshipment by China through Canada and Mexico, and it is vital that Canada not be regarded as a leaky entry point into U.S. markets. Just as Canada resolved to align with the U.S. on its Inflation Reduction Act incentives to encourage domestic battery and EV production, it now follows that Canada will need to address Chinese subsidies, overcapacity, and potential jump dumping on the Canadian market. Given current global dependence on Chinese critical minerals and processing capacity, Canada must weigh its options very carefully. Mexico faces its own challenges in this regard, particularly with respect to onshore Chinese investment. Nevertheless, since maintaining open tariff-free trade with the U.S. reflects Canada's most important economic interest, we must address this issue. I hope these three recommendations can help position Canada to achieve its ultimate objectives for a successful extension of Kuzma in 2026. Millions of Canadians rely on the agreement's success and your committee is engaged in vital work. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Lilly. Uh, Mr. Laycroft or Mr. Chafe? It's, yeah, it's Jack Chafe. On behalf of the Canadian Cattle Association, CCA, I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to your committee on the Kuzma Review today. My name is Jack Chafe, Officer at Large with CCA and have a feedlot in southwestern Ontario where I farm with my family. Also joining me today is Dennis Laycraft, Executive Vice President of CCA, who also will be here to answer questions later. CCA represents 60,000 beef producers across Canada from cow-calf farms and ranches through to feedlots. Our sector generates $21.8 billion to Canada's GDP annually and trade is key to our economic success. Of our beef production, approximately half is exported to international trade and adds about 40% of the value to each animal. 
Looking at North America, U.S. is our largest trading partner and Mexico is our third largest with uh, falling in behind Japan. Historically, CCA has been involved in the Kuzma negotiations and its predecessor, NAFTA, and its predecessor, the Canada-U.S. Trade Agreement. I mention this because historically, North America trade of live cattle and beef always has been our highest priority. Our exports, 85% is sent to the U.S. In, in 2023, the value of live cattle and beef exports to the U.S. and Mexico exceeded $6 billion. It is essential that all three governments look at the CUSMA review with a do not harm approach, focusing on the success for all three countries. CCA, together with our American and Mexican counterparts hold three trilateral meetings annually working together to strengthen the North American trade and combat global challenges. At our most recent meeting, we discussed the upcoming review. Our three national associations are united in ensuring a strong North American integrated beef supply chain. And at our upcoming meeting this summer in Saskatoon, we will be reviewing the, the Kuzma and coming out of there with a un, unified statement moving into the 26th review. The integration of the North American beef sector has demonstrated its resilience and challenges as working through the pandemic and during weather related issues and have come up with a strong integrated supply chain. As we discuss the 2026 Kuzma review today, I would be remiss if I did not mention the current challenges we are facing with the USA and their, and their final ruling on voluntary product of US labeling, which will also come into effect in 2026. CCA and the Government of Canada submitted extensive comments to the USDA expressing our concerns on this ruling, suggesting an alternative would be concise with international practices which USDA is clearly not in this ruling. Further, US is making a ruling mandatory for federal procurement requirements. CCA continues to work with AFC, Global Affairs Canada, the Canadian Embassy in DC on this file, and are monitoring closely the segregation of cattle, which would impact beef producers on both sides of the border. We remain concerned that the ruling will lead to discrimination against live cattle imports and undermine the beneficial integration of the North American supply chain. In the context of today's study, it is key that your committee is aware of these trade tensions. We encourage the committee to take a Team Canada approach as we look at the 2026 CUSMA review. There is a lot at risk and we emphasize the do not harm approach. We echo the national cattle feeders who were here at your committee last week and focusing on regulatory cooperation and ensuring trade ablicling measures, which would be the goal, rather than new tariffs and trade restrictions. As we've seen in the past, our message is stronger when we work together with the federal and provincial governments and industry. On behalf of the Canadian beef farmers and ranchers, we will remain committed to working with you on the best trade outcome in 2026. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I need to check with the committee. There is seven minutes left. If there are members that uh, want to leave and go and vote in the House, I can suspend the meeting if that's the will of the committee. Does the committee want to continue on for another five minutes, then suspend? Or are those, if there's any members that want to be going to the House to vote, they can go now and I can suspend while they go. I'm sorry, Mr. Canning, do you want, would you, you're okay to vote here? You want, okay. Mr. Wilson, are you staying or you're going? So I'm going to suspend uh, until... Uh, till the members have had an opportunity to vote and return back to the committee.
My apologies for the delay. Uh, Mr. Barry Shaw, I invite you to speak to the committee for up to five minutes, please. Lost him. Okay, I'll go to Mr. Landsberg. Uh, Mr. Landsberg, up to five minutes, please. Oops, we got you back. Okay, thank you. My apologies. Mr. Please, Mr. Barry Shaw, up to five minutes. Hi there. Um, my name is Nick Barry Shaw. I'm the trade and privatization campaigner with the Council of Canadians, um, which is a grassroots membership-based organization comprised of 43 chapters across the country and uniting over 150,000 supporters from coast to coast to coast. 
I'm happy to be here to speak about uh, the Kuzma Review because uh, as many of you, some of you may know, the council was founded in 1985 in the crucible of debates around continental free trade, first with the United States and then with Mexico. And throughout uh, our organization's history, we've campaigned against corporate trade deals like NAFTA that put profits before people and the planet. And so I guess uh, the first thing I just wanted to remark on was that we're in a kind of strange moment where uh, at the kind of political and media elite level, there is a very strong consensus in favor of continuing with, um, with these trade deals as is. And yet there is simultaneously a recognition that they've done a tremendous amount of harm to ordinary Canadians. So you have even diehard defenders of free trade like Andrew Coyne, who are basically forced to admit that the economic results of the last 30 years have been dismal. Uh, in a recent column, Coyne wrote that despite Canada's trade and broader economic policies being, quote, an example of everything that orthodox economics would recommend as recipes for prosperity, Canada's productivity has slumped and growth rates have fallen. How could this be, Coyne wrote, uh, we did everything right. Now, the confusion that defenders of that orthodoxy feel, I think, was not uh, something that uh, afflicted the Council of Canadians uh, or its allies in the fight against these free trade deals. When they were first being negotiated, we argued that they would decimate manufacturing employ employment and drive down workers' wages in Canada as corporations restructured production in search of the lowest costs. We argued that investor state dispute mechanisms like NAFTA's Chapter 11 would allow corporations to sue governments even if they were pursuing legitimate efforts to regulate business and protect the environment. And we argued that the pressure to attract increasingly footloose foreign investment through subsidies and corporate tax cuts would inevitably erode our fiscal base and therefore our public services, most notably our healthcare system. And so it gives me really no pleasure to note that these warnings from the Council of Canadian over the years about what free trade would bring to us uh, are largely correct. Rather than a vigorous competitive economy, Canadians have an economic landscape dominated by oligopolies, the result of corporate consolidation on a continental scale. Uh, rather than a rising tide that lifts all boats, Canadians have experienced stagnant wages, rising prices, and spiraling income and wealth inequality. Um, the renegotiation of NAFTA into the Canada-US-Mexico agreement brought several welcome departures from this tired and discredited economic orthodoxy, notably the removal of Chapter 11 and the creation of the rapid response mechanism to protect Mexican workers against violations of their right to form a union. The 2026 review of Kuzma is an opportunity to continue in this direction. And for that reason, the Council of Canadians wholeheartedly supports efforts to expand enforceable labor rights protections by widening the scope and applicability of the rapid response mechanism to all workers in North America and to a broader list of labor rights violations. Uh, we also strongly believe that the last vestiges of NAFTA's Chapter 11, which would live on in Kuzma's more limited Chapter 14, should be done away with as should investor state dispute settlement mechanisms in other treaties that continue to constrain legitimate efforts to take on uh, climate change and to protect the environment. Um, but it's not clear to us that it's possible to fully reverse engineer Kuzma into a trade and investment agreement that places workers' rights, climate action, and environmental protection ahead of corporate profits. Despite the removal of chapter 11, Kuzma continues to hamper the Mexican gov government's efforts to reassert its energy and food sovereignty. Uh, just to give one recent example, in February 2023, the Mexican government announced its intention to ban the pesticide glyph glyphosate and phase out genetically modified corn. In response to outcry from U.S. agribusiness, the U.S. government initiated a trade challenge, not under Chapter 11 or Chapter 14, but under Chapter 31, citing violations of Kuzma's sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Uh, while the Mexican government has emphasized the need to protect indigenous varieties of maize from genetic contamination by GM corn, the U.S. has attempted to narrow the issue to whether GM corn is safe to consume, claiming that Mexico's phase-out is not, quote, science-based. And so the, the trouble with this regulatory standard 
that is in Kuzma, in addition to rejecting the precautionary principle and the wider concerns about food sovereignty that have motivated Mexico's decision, is that it ignores the enormous upstream efforts to warp the, quote, science deployed by agribusiness and other industries. Uh, as the Monsanto papers revealed, this went so far as to recruiting scientists to publish studies that ultimately defended the safety of their products, some of which were secretly reviewed by Monsanto prior to publication. And so this is an issue that the Council of Canadians, and especially its Northumberland chapter, has been paying a lot of attention to. And unfortunately, the Canadian government has sided with the U.S. in this dispute and also blocked the efforts of our Northumberland chapter to present arguments uh, in favor of this phase out. And so I guess I'll just close by saying that the scale of the problems we face, the climate crisis first and foremost, require a rethinking of the entire economic model that these deals were really meant to entrench. Uh, we need trade and investment agreements that will help rather than hinder the shift away from fossil fuels and the massive public investment in infrastructure and in green manufacturing that it requires. We need trade deals that will increase rather than erode workers' bargaining power. And we need trade deals that will facilitate the rebuilding of our public services that have been uh, you know, worn down by years of neglect. Um, very, thank so, you very much, Mr. Barry Shaw. On to Mr. Lance Bergen, you. please. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the invitation to testify today. Since it was only late last month that I testified before this committee, I will forego my usual introduction of FCC and the sector. The Canadian seafood sector accounts for $7.6 billion in exports to over 100 countries, and our southern neighbour is our largest market at $4.8 billion of our exports, more than triple the next market. Also noteworthy is that our seafood imports from the U.S. are $1.2 billion, leaving us with a trade surplus in seafood of $3.6 billion. Now, I'm pleased to say that our seafood exports to the U.S. are up 57% over the last decade. So it goes without saying that we value our trading relationship with the U.S. Our top export products to the U.S. are lobster at $1.6 billion, crab at $1.1 billion, salmon at $975 million, the latter being farmed, and then halibut and scallops are the distant third and fourth, uh, both nearing $200 million or fourth and fifth, sorry. Uh, the top import products are salmon at 415 million, lobster at 283 million, crab at 140 million, with scallops at 29 million, and cod at 17 million, rounding out the top five. Fish and seafood had no tariffs under NAFTA, and that was maintained under Kuzma, and obviously we would want this to continue. The important thing to remember on this is that the U.S. is a net importer of fish and seafood to the tune of $20 billion annually. That represents 80% of their domestic market. This could motivate an administration to apply a tariff in the belief it could help the domestic industry. Former President Trump did do this with tariffs against Chinese imports. And seafood is the most globally traded food commodity. The global supply chain is complex and products can be exported and re-exported before it reaches its final consumer. So the impacts of tariffs in the U.S. are equally complex. Suffice it to say, we prefer free trade. Of equal importance is how Kuzma protects us from non-tariff barriers. We don't want other government actions to disadvantage or prohibit our access to the U.S. market. Just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about restrictive import policies and whether they were creating undue barriers to Canadian sea Canadian exports of fish and seafood. Granted, there are some real challenges in the global industry that governments need to address individually and collectively, but it's important to do that in a way that does not unduly restrict trade. Kuzma has a dispute resolution mechanism, which is vitally important, and there are also mechanisms under WTO. But the challenge with these is that they are very time consuming, and the offending measure is in place during the proceedings, meaning that the damage continues to being done. Reimbursement or retribution after the fact is sometimes cold comfort. Having said that, these provisions are like insurance. You hope you don't need it, but you don't want to get caught without it. The best way to deal with non-tariff barriers is to try to prevent them in the first place. In order to do that, we need to have a positive relationship built on constructive and regular dialogue. This needs to happen government to government, but also industry to industry. For example, DFO, Agriculture Canada and CFIA are able to 
engage with their counterparts to discuss issues of mutual interest. In fact, NOAA has recently reached out to DFO to discuss their review of the Seafood Import Monitoring Program, or SIMP, and Canada was uh, the first it called for input. So this is helpful and a signal of a good relationship. On the industry side, FCC has a good relationship with our American counterparts, the National Fisheries Institute, and we compare notes on issues of mutual interest. The most recent examples are SIMP and some proposed EU regulations that could affect live lobster exports from both countries. We sought their views on the SIMP review and we brought to their attention the proposed regulations on animal health uh, transport. The relationship between the two countries is also supported by the fact that they provide secretariat services to the International Coalition of Fisheries Associations and I am the current chair of the board. So we work closely on behalf of members of our international group and our respective participation in international dialogues also enables more regular conversations about current events. To sum up, we need Kuzma as it provides important structure to our trading relationship, but we need to be engaged and present in regular dialogue. The Team Canada is an important step in lead up to the Kuzma review. And with that, I will uh, thank you and, and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Heather, please. Madam Chair, on behalf of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, I thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here and provide testimony to the Standing Committee as it evaluates actions ahead of the Kuzma Review. The Chamber has a long-standing commitment to the North American economic relationship. No organization in the United States has been more vocal advocate for a strong and mutually beneficial partnership with Canada and Mexico. We are guided by principle, not politics. We defend and promote free enterprise, free markets, rules-based trade and investment, and the rule of law. The trilateral relationship goes beyond the impact of our $1.7 trillion annual three-ray trade to include significant direct investment ties and highly integrated value chains that support millions of jobs across all three countries. Our three countries have the potential to expand the important relationship and work together to meet shared challenges, such as diversification of semiconductor production, energy security, energy transition, food security, and critical minerals. Kuzma is intended to facilitate closer economic cooperation and to provide legal certainty for cross-border trade and investment. The Chamber calls on each of the three governments to address implementation and compliance issues and uphold the spirit and letter of the agreement. In short, we each must keep our word. For example, the Chamber has called for the U.S. government to uphold the Dispute Settlement Panel ruling automotive rules of origin published back in January of 2023. As we aim to make North America the most competitive global platform for vehicle production, the future of the continent's automotive industry depends on the certainty provided by this agreement. In addition, maintaining our competitive edge also means avoiding the expansion of U.S.-driven by American policies. In short, we need to recognize that in North America, we make things together. At the same time, we appreciate the opportunity to also highlight areas that require Canada to fulfill its Kuzma commitments. Canada is advancing an ambitious digital agenda. We are concerned that Canada is looking to bolster its competitiveness at times by targeting U.S. businesses. Such policies not only erode Canada's culture of innovation and competitiveness, but also undermine Canada's commitment to maintaining open and fair business climates. First, I'd like to flag our concern with the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunication Commission's decision to impose an initial-based contribution of 5% on U.S. streaming services. This decision fails to recognize the investments made by American streaming services in Canada's creative sector. Indeed, Americans can hardly turn their televisions on without seeing programs created here in Canada. Consequently, Americans find it ironic that Bill C-11 specifically targets U.S. companies in a matter that may violate Canada's international trading obligations, including those under Kuzma. This action appears to contravene commitments that guarantee a minimal standard of treatment, require equal treatment of foreigners and local enterprises, and obligate Canada to refrain from imposing certain performance requirements to foreign direct investment. Second is our deep concern over the potential for Canada to reintroduce its unilateral digital services tax through implementing Bill C-59. The DST is set, to dis uh, is set to introduce discriminatory measures against U.S. companies, violating Canada's obligations under Kuzma and the WTO, and contradicting Canada's commitment to the G20 OECD process. Adding to our concern is the fact that Canada's proposed DST is two, potentially three years retroactive. We would note that the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative has investigated several substantially similar measures as those proposed by Canada, including a French DST in which the Canada's uh, version is modeled, 
and found them to be unreasonable or discriminatory, burdensome or restrictive of U.S. commerce, and thus actionable under U.S. trade law. Lastly, we have serious concerns with the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act, which is part of Bill C-27, currently being studied by your colleagues in the House of Commons Industry Committee. In its current draft, the bill is overly broad and restrictive, capturing a potentially endless number of low-risk use cases, which risk putting Canada out of step with the U.S. and other importing printing partners on AI regulation. If it moves forward, we are concerned it will have an adverse impact on Canada's competitiveness, hinder AI development, limit business exploration, and ultimately affect productivity and economic growth. During our visit to Ottawa this week, we'll be hosting an AI policy dialogue precisely to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities related to AI. At the Chamber, we are focused on keeping the 2026 Kuzma Review in perspective. While the three trading partners are sovereign states, no one has identified a compelling reason to undertake a wide-ranging renegotiation of this agreement. Primarily, this upcoming review is an opportunity to ensure implementation and compliance with the existing commitments. Having said that, the Canadian policies such as Bill C-11, the proposed DST, and Canada's approach to AI all have the potential to complicate this review. Perceptions that Canada is violating Kuzma commitments will serve to increase pressure to criticize the agreement during the review process. In closing, the Chamber stands ready to work with our partners in Canada to continue to build a strong North American partnership. We thank you for this opportunity to share our views at this hearing and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, we have approximately 20 minutes remaining. Uh, I'm suggesting we complete round one with five minutes each, uh, each member. All right, Mr. Seaback, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Very interested to hear um, what Dr. Lilly and uh, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Heather just t talked about on the trade irritants. So my, so my concern as we look into this review, and I've called this in other committees, we're going through a series of what I call own goals uh, in Canada that will frustrate, potentially frustrate this review. And so I just want to ask both of you, um, uh, Dr. Lilly and Mr. Heather, um, the Online Streaming Act, the DST, and C27, if these all go and are implemented as it looks like the current government wants to, will this make the CUSMA review uh, easier or more complicated in your view? Thank you for the question. Um, on the Online Streaming Act and, and the Digital uh, Services Tax, if these move forward, I fully expect action to happen before the 2026 review. I think the Americans will respond. Um, the, and the, the two pieces are slightly different because the Online Streaming Act um, can trigger retaliation associated with the cultural exemption in a way that is different than the digital services tax. And so um, we could expect retaliation on the Online Streaming Act any time uh, after it actually comes into effect, whereas the Digital Streaming Act, if the Americans want to dispute that, they would have to take it to a section or to a Chapter 31 case. Um, but both those things to say, I think that they, these will complicate the process and they will result in a, a full review if they aren't addressed before then. Yeah. I would agree with um, Dr. Lilly that uh, the likelihood that uh, if these three things uh, come into force, um, that there will be response by the United States perhaps before the, the Kuzma review. Um, that's not to suggest that that would be the end of it. Uh, so these things would certainly be a part of that review process and would be a weight uh, towards moving that review process uh, forward successfully. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Dr. Lee, you, you talked a little bit about anti-circumvention and anti-dumping and anti with respect to what's going on with Chinese um, EVs and steel. Um, we have a bad record under this government of responding to these issues. We were, you know, sort of broadsided with 232 tariffs uh, with aluminum and steel because we were viewed as the, the dumping ground for things down in the United States. Um, the Canadian steel producers came before committee. They said the anti-circumvention legislation in place here in the system is not sufficient to deal with anti-circumvention. And they've been calling on the government to make changes to that to prevent exactly what happened. Uh, with those 232 tariffs. Nothing has changed. Um, so do you see that also as a problem uh, as we head up to this review if something's not done to make sure we're not the dumping ground? I, I think Canada is going to have to respond on the EV issue soon. Again, probably sooner than the Kuzma review. Um, when it comes to circumvention and port inspections, uh, Canada is not doing enough. 
Um, and we can see that with things like the um, enforcement of, of elimination of forced labor from our supply chains. Um, certainly, there were concerns from the Americans during the NAFTA negotiations around transshipment of uh, Chinese steel and aluminum through Canada. Uh, that's constantly, I think, on the radar of the Americans, and so it's something that we'll have to watch very, very carefully. And uh, there will there will necessarily be increased pressure, uh, both as the Americans move forward with their tariffs on Chinese EVs, but also as the EU moves ahead, and we expect details on that this week. Um, then any country that doesn't have similar measures in place is going to become a target. So, so yes, it's something we need to take very seriously and increase our enforcement around these issues. Yeah, it's, just, it's just shocking to me why we're always so slow compared to other countries around the world to respond to these things. You did raise the issue of uh, forced labour. We know that was actually part of the renewed uh, KUSMA. And Canada also has an absolutely abysmal record of stopping the importation of goods made with forced labor, especially Uyghur forced labor in Xinjiang. Um, U.S. has an entities list. They've, uh, they've uh, seized billions of dollars of goods. Canada's done absolutely nothing. We've seized nothing. Um, do you think that also could be an impediment? Canada's clear inability to even honor, under this current government, to honor our obligations under KUSMA on the forced labor issues? Uh, I'm sorry, but I have to ask for a brief answer. I, I think it's less of an issue for Kuzma. It could come up, but I actually just think it's it's Canada not doing the right thing, and we should take these responsibilities very seriously and these human rights violations very seriously. Thank you. Mr. Sidhu, for five minutes, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the witnesses for taking the time to be here today. Uh, my question is for, for Mr. Heather. Uh, as you know, trade within Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. supports millions of jobs in our respective countries. Uh, to my understanding, 49 U.S. states count Canada or Mexico as one of their top three merchandise export markets. Uh, would you say there is widespread awareness in the United States in municipalities and states in terms of the economic value of trade and jobs impacted at the local level? I would say that trade is never polled as a top political issue in our national politics. Um, but I think every American uh, values what trade has brought to their daily lives. Uh, so um, when you ask the question, uh, which is, you know, what level is the consciousness of trade in right. the average American, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a difficult way to, to crystallize it because in some ways it's not something that they think about when they go to the polls. But at the same time, uh, Americans do very much uh, value the products and services that are on American shelves uh, that come from around the world. And just to follow up to that, uh, what can we do to further improve that understanding uh, of trade between our countries? I know in the past, uh, you know, in the newspapers, uh, pages have been taken out to, to express, um, you know, the meaningful impact that our trade has had on, on U.S. cities. But is there more that we can do to raise that awareness uh, within, you know, within the U.S. cities and towns? Well, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is made up of about 3,000 state local chambers, and for every major trade agreement that the United States has been a party to, uh, we have activated that federation of state and local chambers uh, to help tell that story. Uh, often we have taken with us uh, ambassadors uh, from Washington for our trading partners uh, to do whistle-stop tours uh, to various states uh, to get out and meet um, those folks in those communities where uh, trade is happening. Uh, and certainly, uh, we are prepared to continue that in support of uh, the Kuzma Review. Thank you for that. And as you know, um, the Prime Minister has announced our, our Team Canada U.S. engagement strategy earlier this year, uh, being led by Minister Ng and Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne and, of course, Ambassador Hillman. Uh, and so part of my, my role is to go out to municipalities across Canada to, to see if we can bring in those stories and share them with our U.S. counterparts. Uh, and so I'm going to turn to Mr. Uh, Schaff uh, about, you know, what are your, your conversations like in terms of uh, with some of your counterparts down in the U.S., and where do you think the government should be focusing on our Team Canada U.S. engagement strategy? Yeah, that, sorry, it's Dennis Laycraft. Uh, it's, it's a great question. Uh, we've, for many years, maintained a very active uh, communication strategy in the United States. We go to many of the state meetings. 
we participate in what's called SARL, the State Agricultural Rural Leaders Meeting, the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. There's one in the east. There's NASDA, the North American Departments of Excu Agriculture. Uh, excuse me. Meeting. I'm sorry. You have to interrupt. The, the bells are ringing. It's a 30-minute bell. Does the committee okay to continue on until we finish, till we get to 5.30? Okay, fine. Thank you. You have a minute and 33 five seconds remaining. And as, as uh, Mr. Chafe mentioned, we do have trilateral meetings three times a year where we work with our, our counterparts down there. So we have a great relationship with the state associations at the state level, which, of course, governors and all of this are very influential down there in U.S. So if we consider our work down there almost as important as our work here when you export almost half of our production to the United States. And there's been a really mutual beneficial relationship that, that has grown as a result of this. And, you know, it's one of these, it was mentioned earlier, the question, how much do people in the United States appreciate how important trade is? To be honest, that's a similar question we should ask in Canada. There's a lot more work we all need to do to really talk about how beneficial this North American agreement is for our industry. It's, it's really a lifeblood for, for many of our producers to be able to maintain it and grow forward. Yeah. I've got about 20 